Sorry to cut into your time a little bit, but we can go over to uh, just introducing Veronique, uh, who's the Chief uh, Science Officer from PLOS. And thank you very much for joining us. So give a round of applause. Thank you. Can you hear me? Is it is it all right? Perfect. Thank you. Um, well, thanks very much. It's it's really fun and uh, a great pleasure to be here. Um, I I'm using the term um, open science publishing because I want to share some of the experience that I've had at PLOS, and I like to think of PLOS not just as a publisher but as an open science organization. And um, there are a lot of people who are very familiar with PLOS in the in in the room uh, and and who know very well that um, PLOS actually didn't start as a, a publisher or an open science organization. I mean, actually, PLOS became a publisher originally um, to prove a point, the point being that uh, everybody thought that open access, the, the open access model would not allow to publish quality content or selective content. And, uh, and PLOS decided they were going to demonstrate that that was possible. And that's very much been a sort of modus operandi at, at PLOS is like challenging the status quo by demonstrating that alternatives are feasible. Um, and then they went on to prove other points, and lo and behold, we are a publisher. So what I'm sharing today is also the experience of the constraints of and the challenges of working um, at scale uh, with a very complex audience, uh, multidisciplinary, global. Uh, and so these are these are really sort of the constraints in which we are we are opening. And and um, over the the years, Plus has expanded its its focus from open access to the broader scope of open open science. And a lot of things have have actually um, changed in the in in the landscape of scholarly communication since. And if you think about all the things we've been talking about for the last few days, the the the, the infrastructure that is really matured, lots of repositories for different types of research outputs, um, preprint servers, organizations like uh, Pre Review who organize um, peer review of preprints. And so in that context, we I often hear the question. Um, do we still need publishers, right? And and therefore, should Plus still be a publisher? Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, I tend to think that yes, we still need publishers, but perhaps not in the typical traditional roles that we've thought about publisher and that have been associated with publishers. And so I'd like to reframe this question um, by what does it mean to be an open science publisher today and how should that uh, continue to evolve? Um, I would like to ground this discussion in the open science definition that is provided by UNESCO, because I think this definition does something very important. It, um, it focuses on access to knowledge, but also on equitable participation in knowledge creation. And that's a very important aspect of open science that I don't think we necessarily thought about very um, thoroughly in the early days of, of open science. So, so what are the um, the roles that um, I, I want to talk about? Three roles that I think today publishers can play in the uh, scholarly communication um, uh, uh, ecosystem if they choose to. And the first one is to um, influence decisions about being open and transparent. Um, as publishers, we interact with researchers at the time where they are making decisions about how open they want to be about describing their research process. And that's a very good point to actually leverage or influence. And I think we have two main ways of, of influencing. The first one is policy. Um, and so, you know, we talked, Daniela talked yesterday about uh, the open data policy at PLOS that started and was a bit, you know, rocky, but actually started changing how people thought about this. Much more recently, um, the staff at PLOS worked with the editorial board of PLOS Computational Biology because they felt they have, the, they have an open uh, community with sharing things, but not enough. And, and that's a quote from um, uh, Jason Pappen, one of the co-editors in chief. They worked with the staff to shape a policy. Um, they really consulted with the editorial board about how this policy should be framed and should be articulated. The staff worked really clearly about how to implement it and, and, and get compliance with this policy. And I think the results are 
you know, really unequivocal. That's the, the policy implementation in 2021. Uh, now we have more than 90% of articles that actually share code. And this was a, a community that was receptive to that already at the beginning, but you see that without the policy in place, you don't quite get the level of compliance. So that's, to me, is an, is a, an illustration of influence. The other way that we have to, um, uh, to influence decisions is by making it easier for people. And I think a good example of that is the um, integration that PLOS has established with preprint servers, uh, BioArchive, MedArchive, EarthArchive. Um, I think with preprints being um, so popular in, in, in the biomedical science now, one might be forgot, forgiven to, to forget how much of an uphill battle it was even less than 10 years ago. Um, and part of the problem was also coming because a lot of publishers were sending mixed signals saying, well, if you preprint your paper, we might not consider it for publication because it's not new anymore and so on. And that was, I mean, researchers were, were very concerned about it. And I think that PLOS made two important decisions at, the, at that point. The first one was that, um, because also in the background, a lot of these publishers were developing their own preprint servers, right? As a feeder to their portfolio of journals. And plus the decided that we abandoned actually the idea of having our own preprint servers. We discussed with the community, with BioArchive, which we felt were very sort of like-minded organizations. And we decided we were going to rally be behind one resource as opposed to sort of competing or creating other things. And, um, and so this data uh, comes from, I mean, Richard Sever um, uh, shared that with me. Um, and you see really, I mean, the, the other important decision we made at, the, at that point is that we were not just going to have a policy of saying, yes, you can preprint. We actually offered authors to post preprints on their behalf at submission. And what you see he here in 2018 is the impact of that implementation. Um, and, and so these are the numbers of preprints um, on BioArchive during these years that were associated with um, the different bars or different plus journals the blue bar being plus one with the largest volume. And you see that in 2019, the first full year, really almost 10% of the content of BioArchive was associated with a PLOS publication. And if you think that we are actually submitting at submissions, there was actually much more content that we, we fed to BioArchive at the, at the, the beginning. And I, I like to think that that was an important thing to, to address these ambiguities, these problems, these things, and that we actually started um, helping to sort of change the behavior in the in the community. Uh, you might ask, William, it's it's very it's um, undirect evidence, I guess. And you might ask, when are we able to do that when it really matters? And of course, the um, uh, example that springs to mind about that is the COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, in many ways, it's been hailed as a, as an open science a triumph of open science because there was a lot of collaboration uh, during that that time. There was an, an external motivator to really uh, be able to um, you know go beyond like academic incentives and that kind of thing to collaborate and and share. Um, and and it started with you know uh, an act that was very much an act of open science, which is when Zhang Yongzhen. Um, uh, sequenced the first isolate of SARS-CoV-2 in China and posted it in a, a, on a, a public database. Uh, within two days, Kizzy Corbett in Bethesda created the mRNA vaccine construct. 66 days later, the first patient was dosed in a clinical trial. That is really open science in action, this, be this beginning of sharing. Obviously, it came from a community that, that really was already prime to sharing. It's not, it didn't start there. It was the genomics community, the pathogens community. They are sharing, they have these, these incentives, but that's really, I think, the beginning of that. Um, the, the recognition that it, there was this motivator uh, was not lost on um, the Wellcome Trust uh, in the UK and, and OSTP in the US, which um, very early in the pandemic um, urged, uh, launched a call to publishers and researchers um, to be more open, to adopt open science principles. And they required three commitments, um, immediate free access to uh, peer-reviewed publication, data sharing at the time of publication, and preprint before publication. Um, 160 organizations, including 30 publishers, signed that pledge very quickly. 
that was very encouraging. Um, a year later, um, a group at the Rory Institute led by Ludo Waltman took stock of how we were doing. 90% free access, that's pretty good. But note that among these 90%, 28% did not have a CC license. Some of that content is back behind a paywall. Um, very difficult to estimate data sharing in that data set, depending on the estimates, 11 to uh, 28 percent. Um, and in terms of preprint, at that time, they, find that they found that 5 percent of COVID articles had a, an associated preprint. I wouldn't exactly call that a triumph of open science by any definition of the term. And, and actually, but it's not too surprising if you think about it. At that time, everybody, including publishers, were completely scrambling. Okay? This isn't the time to start, as I was saying, you know, the, the work, for example, that went in these policies and so on. It, it takes work. It takes work to articulate a policy. It takes work to establish the workflows, to check for compliance. It, take res it takes resources. This wasn't the time to actually do that. And, and I think that it's, it's reflected that. What was remarkable to me is that for PLOS, these three commitments we're business as usual. We, were, we didn't have to do anything. We actually increased the scrutiny for these papers to make sure we were compliant, but we didn't have really to do much more than that. And I was curious to see if that made a difference. And so Ross Gray and my team um, looked at uh, two data sets. Um, first, the um, Open Science Indicator data sets, which is a, a data set we've developed looking at the whole PLOS corpus to understand um, how open science is practiced in, in our corpus. And that's one of the indicators which shows how data is shared and, and specifically the percentage of papers that have data shared in repositories. And so that's what you see uh, across the, the, the entire PLOS portfolio. You see that there isn't really a, a, a step change during, um, during the, the early years of the pandemic. And then um, Ross cross-referenced this with uh, the CORD19 um, data set, which is basically a curated data set of coronavirus uh, articles, which um, before COVID-19 was coronavirus, after 2020, it becomes COVID-19 pretty much exclusively. And so by cross-references these two data sets, we are able to look at the COVID-19 papers published at PLOS during that time. And what you see is that before the outbreak of the pandemic, that community of coronavirus researchers actually were sharing data in repositories at lower rates than, um, than the average that we see across PLOS. That behavior changed dramatically when the, 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 the outbreak started. And indeed, we had these ways of facilitating um, uh, that and, and insisting on that. And then we also have a, a smaller um, comparator set, which is topic matched for the, the PLOS data set. And if you look at that as a control, as sort of what, what where, um, uh, uh, how were COVID-19 papers published outside of PLOS data. And with the caveat that it's a much smaller data set, so it's, the data is less accurate, what you see is that it's a similar trend, but much less than what we've seen at PLOS. And this to me suggests that having the policies in place, having the processes in place, the checks, the help for the researchers is actually really helping uh, when, when there is an external motivator to change behavior. So um, shifting gears to the other aspect of the, US, the UNESCO definition of open science, the participation in that, I, I, in, in creation of knowledge and in dissemination of, of knowledge. I do believe that there is a very strong role that publishers can play in, in this, and that actually they should play. Um, why is it important? It's important because the, the research ecosystem in which, and the, the scholarly communication ecosystem in which we are evolving is actually really ripe with biases. Um, this is the work from uh, Juan, pa uh, Juan Pablo Alperin and Rodrigo Costa at the Skullcomb Lab. And it's what the map of the world would look like if the size of the countries were scaled based on the number of researchers published in Scopus. There is an entire hemisphere that is missing from there. It's not that there is no research being done there, is that in our scholarly um, system, communication systems, this research is not visible. And that's really problematic. Um, 
there are issues with the research ecosystem as well. Um, this is the work of uh, Vincent Larivière and um, Cassidy Sujimoto looking at gender balance. And um, so the map is color coded based on the ratio of uh, female to male ratio um, in authorship. Um, white is parity. Anything that is that has a blue tone is actually women are underrepresented. Across the globe, the average is about 30%. It goes down to 25% representation of women in senior authorship positions. That's not necessarily the scholarly communication system. That's the research ecosystem itself. And so it's problematic in, in several ways, not only because it's inherently unfair, but it's also because when you have um, research communities that have these kinds of unequal representation, the research is less objective. I find the, um, the arguments of um, Helen Longino, the philosopher of science, and uh, Naomi Oreskes, the uh, historian of science, very compelling in that regard. They have looked at, um, especially as uh, studies that, that look at gender across the history of, of science. And um, Longino argues that science is only objective because it's social knowledge. Uh, we tend to think of uh, science as objective because it's based on facts. But what that definition ignores is that science is done by scientists. And when they formulate hypotheses and when they collect data to test these hypotheses, they are bringing to bear their background, their experiences, um, their values. And it, science can only be objective if these assumptions that they're making based on that are challenged by groups with different background experiences and values. And so when you have a scientific community that is so homogeneous that everybody makes the same, the same assumptions, these assumptions become invisible. Um, if you have a scientific community where groups are really woefully um, underrepresented, or if they're not given the intellectual authority to challenge assumptions, we're really missing an opportunity to make science more objective. Um, and there are, in, in these books, I really recommend them, there is a lot of um, examples of that happening over the years, and you see that really with women being increasingly represented in science and how it changes the narratives, the hypotheses that are being, that are being tested. Um, so Oreskes um, concludes, based on, on the work of Longino and others, that objectivity is likely to be maximized when there are recognized and robust avenues for criticism, such as peer review, and when the community is open, non-defensive, responsive to criticism, and when it's sufficiently diverse that a broad range of views can be developed, heard, and appropriately considered. And that doesn't happen by chance. These inequities that are in the system are not solving themselves. They actually require a lot of deliberate efforts to, to, to change. And we've had some experience of that at PLOS recently. Um, in 2021, we launched uh, plus global public health. And those fantastic individuals, um, Catherine Kyobutungi and, and uh, Madhu Pai, really had the vision for this journal to address inequities, deeply entrenched inequities in public health research. Um, and so they were very, very deliberate about the formation of their editorial board. And the reason why that's important is that there is also a lot of emerging evidence that in peer review, we see a lot of homophily. And what I mean by that is that editors tend to handle papers from their region. Editors tend to pick reviewers from their region. Um, you, we see, there is some evidence of homophily in editorial decision based on gender, for example. A, whim, a woman editor will, have, will be more likely to accept a paper from a woman um, uh, last author. It works in both, both ways, but when you have underrepresentation of, of a group, that just entrenches the inequities that are, that are in the system. So they wanted to be very deliberate about forming, about um, having really the group that is governing peer review, being as diverse as possible. Two years on this, in this editorial, they take stock um, and really they have um, done a fantastic job at having representation from the Global South and from uh, women in particular. Uh, much more recently, uh, uh, PLOS Mental Health uh, public, uh, published his first papers in June. And again, two fantastic individuals, Charlene Sunkel and Rochelle Burgess, who, whose vision is to elevate a different type of group, the, the, the groups with lived experiences in mental health. 
And so again, elevating this voice, these voices is taking a lot of deliberate effort and deliberate resourcing. I want to give credit there to um, the editorial and publishing teams at PLAS who are really working first to identify these kinds of individuals and leaders who are really who have that vision and will do that, but also in um, uh, supporting them in providing resources to be able to realize that vision. It doesn't, it's, it's not automatic, it really requires a lot of effort. Um, and that brings me to the third important role, uh, which obviously is incredibly important, is to have business models that enable equitable participation in, in science. When this has been a, a very strong issue in the open access field, and I believe really that it's, it's coming to a head and there is a real urgency to do something about it. Um, when we started, when the open access movement started, APCs were seen as um, kind of a necessary evil, something temporary that was going to get sorted. Uh, there were going to be cross subsidies. We were going to give waivers to people who could not pay. Um, waivers are a terrible idea. Researchers need equity, not charity. And I think what was underestimated at the beginning of the, of the open access movement is the fact that APCs really opened the door for an article economy in which there are perverse incentives for publishers to publish more or to charge high prices per publication. And that's exactly what we're seeing now. And with the open access movement really making amazing strides right now, I mean, things like the OSTP memo are, are really fantastic strides. But if we're not addressing this, we're really risking to entrench this model of gold open access as the only model for open access. And, and that is really undermining the, the, the role that we have here. And so I think there is an urgent um, uh, need to, to act here. Um, very frustratingly, PLOS is still reliant on APCs. Right? This is our main revenue source. Um, but under the leadership of Alison, who is in the room, and uh, my colleague Neef O'Connor, um, PLOS has really made strides to try to move away from APCs and trying to really think about creative solutions to, to innovate around the business models. Um, that, was, that really started with um, reframing the conversation with librarians around this need for equity, but also around transparency and accountability on the part of the publishers, you know, of really having, and that really open conversation led to two very interesting models that are being tested at the moment. They are, they're, I mean, we've deployed them uh, and, and they're gaining some traction. The first model is the community action publishing, which was launched to prove that um, you could publish selective journals without charging APCs. And it doesn't need to cost $12,000, let's just be clear. Um, and then the global equity model was launched to, to provide a path for institutions to support open access publishing by their scholars while eliminating APCs. Um, the two models are basically uh, function on the same principle, which is that there are arrangements with institutions who pay an, an annual fee. And under that arrangement, all the researchers from these institutions have unlimited publishing options in, in the journals that are covered. Because it's based on equity uh, and it's built in the, from the system and it's based with deals with institutions and we're exploring deals with funders as well, we can actually um, uh, distribute the cost more equitably between institutions, taking into account the funding level of institutions, the uh, economy of the region, whether they're a teaching institution or uh, a research incentive, uh, intensive institution. So, um, so this is really, I mean, it's early days. Um, it's also very clear to us that if only PLOS does that, it's not going to solve the problem. And so that's why the third pillar here is um, an, an initiative that we have ongoing with uh, Coalition S and uh, GISC uh, in the UK. To, uh, to try to establish principles again, so that other publishers can develop their own models that are gonna work for them according to these, to these principles. It's early days. Um, the type of the, the deals uh, with institutions are about 18% of the revenue that PLOS brings in, um, which is not bad considering they were launched in 2021. Uh, it is growing. Um, and this is just, um, you know, a very, um, low volume but encouraging trend 
Um, this is the uh, representation of uh, uh, low and, and, and lower middle in income countries in the journals that offer the global equity model. This is the field baseline um, that we had in 20, uh, up to 2020. And what you see is that representation from these countries in these journals is actually higher than, than the average. Um, again, very early days, there are multiple things going into that, but these trends are, are encouraging. So um, just re wrapping up in terms of the, the, the three things that I've, I've talked about that I think are three essential functions to be considered in the scholarly um, communication ecosystem. Um, these are roles that can be played by publishers should they choose to do so. It's not obvious, it's, it's others, but I think that it's also something that all um, all mem members of that community of, of scholarly um, uh, communication ecosystem really need to, to think about. Influencing decision around, around sharing transparently and, and reporting transparently, really putting efforts in diversifying the participation in communication, and finally, really an urgent need to innovate on, on, on business models. Um, is, this, is this sufficient? Um, no. Right. What we've done so far, I mean, I don't want to undermine the efforts that I've been talking about and that we've done at PLOS because I think it's been it's been a lot of effort and it's actually we've seen some progress. But if I'm completely honest, that progress is incremental. I also don't want to undermine the other um, organizations well represented in this room that are really working to make um, non-traditional research outputs, non-traditional in air quotes, right? I mean, data, code as primary, like first-class research objects. I think we, we're doing a lot of progress, but I think that there is one elephant in the room, um, which is a really strong headwind of open science. And it's the fact that largely articles are still considered as the only um, valuable output of research in the context of research assessment. Um, and that's really, really, really problematic for open science. Um, and I think that we also, when we are encouraging people and demanding participation in open science and we're demanding open science practices from researchers, we are actually asking them to make a big sacrifice. Um, consider this data from the Global Biodiversity Information Facility Database. This is the largest open database for uh, record of species worldwide. There is a lot of, um, I mean, amazing amount of contributions from the global south in there. This is really where bio biodiversity is. What this map is, is the academic papers published using this data. And it's not coming from the global south. The academic credit is actually reaped by countries that are not necessarily the countries that are actually uh, depositing data. And that's a really big inequity. And that's something we need to think about when we're asking people to share their data, share their code. It, what does it mean for them? And if you think, I mean, this is like a regional example, but it's true even in highly resourced um, environment, right? I mean, in competitive environment, even in the US, if you're an early career researcher and you're deciding to devote resources and efforts to practicing open science and share everything, you're not necessarily rewarded for that. And that means you actually be penalized for that because others, your competitors are choosing to publish in prestigious journals. And that's, and, and that's where their efforts are going. And that's what is rewarded at the moment. And so that is really something that we're gonna have to address. And I think it's tempting to think, well, this is the research assessment community. This is the funders, the institutions, what can we do? I do think that scholarly publishing is also still focused on articles, right? I mean, remember when this conference was called Beyond the PDF? Um, you know, I mean, we're still publishing PDFs. We're still really, and, and that, the, the publishing landscape is where research assessment looks for rewards and recognition. And the problem we have is that these open science practices are not visible in, the, in, in the, the, the scholarly communication, or at least in the publishing ecosystem at the moment. Um, and I think that's problematic because for open science practice to be adopted, it needs to be rewarded and recognized. And for it to be re rewarded and recognized, it needs to be visible to the people who do the recognition and the reward. And if they look in the publishing landscape at the moment, it's very difficult to find that. 
And so that brings me back to my question, what does it mean to be an open science publisher? And I think that we can take much bolder steps in making all of these non-traditional, again, air quotes, um, contribution much more visible in the publishing ecosystem so that they can be counted in the research assessment. Um, and I'm really delighted to be able to say that we've actually received support from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation to try to answer this question at PLOS. And so we are literally now, like we kicked off a couple of weeks ago, starting a research and design project to try to see what would that look like to actually do that in our publishing ecosystem? How could we change how we present and, and collect the information in the, as a publisher to make these contribution much more visible? And so this project has um, three objectives. The first one is really moving beyond the article, not necessarily abandoning article, but actually really making, shifting the emphasis to show all these other non-traditional contributions, to make them visible, um, to make them, this, to be able to disseminate them when it matters, not necessarily with the publication of an article. There's a lot of things that happen before that. There's a lot of things that happen after the publication of an article. Can we capture that? Um, can we capture it and make it discoverable? Um, very importantly, can the, the contributors actually get credit for these specific contributions? Can they be evaluated in their own rights and, and really then integrated in, in research assessment? So the idea is like, what would a design, a publishing solution design look like to really do that? The second objective is really moving beyond the APC from the get-go. We don't want any new solution to be actually depending on APCs. So really starting by building an equitable and sustainable model. Um, it's very important to be able to, to show a path to sustainability, not only for PLOS. I mean, we don't want, I mean, obviously we're doing this at PLOS because we want to challenge and we want to change how we do things. But again, we won't be successful if only plus changes. So we really want to do this in a way that is open, that shares what we, that shows and demonstrate to others who actually want to try that there is a path to sustainability doing that. And so that's why it's very, it's very important. And really the third objective is to work with intentional consultation. All I've been talking about the inequities and the risks of not considering blockers for certain groups um, is very, very important. So. We want to work with researchers across disciplines and across regions. Um, we also want to work very closely with the stakeholders who have the levers of research assessment, funders, um, and research institutions. We want to work with the librarians in terms of those business models, again, globally, to make sure that it works. Um, and we want to work with the members of this community. We want to work with the digital infrastructure that exists. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to plug in. And we want to plug in in a way that others can plug in after, so that we really do something that is um, that, if we're successful, can be adopted much more broadly beyond PLOS. So the goal of this is really, it's an, a year and a half project. We really want to, dem to, at the end of that, know what we want to build. Uh, how much resources we're going to need to build that. Uh, no, have confidence that what we want to build will be usable by researchers, but also by other stakeholders, that it will integrate in the, in the ecosystem, that we have a business model that can support operations, and also that ha we have a group of partners who are willing to go on with us and build that and integrate and test in different, in different contexts. So um, again, we're just starting, uh, and I, I really hope that uh, where we're going to be able to work with with all of you in this in this room for that as well. So, thank you for listening. Um, thanks to the uh, the Plus team, uh, a number of people here, uh, and also um, our funding source. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to do questions again with the mic stand here, if anybody has any questions. And I know tomorrow, as I was mentioning before your talk, that tomorrow we're having. Um, some sessions, and one of them will be led by Veronique, really kind of jumping into some of these discussions she was talking about at the end there with the, the project from the Moore Foundation. Um, any questions from the audience? Yeah. Hello, Sarah Whipperman, OE Works. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. I really like hearing about the way that PLOS is really trying to push the envelope. And as we we're going through here, I was kind of reflecting back to some of the discussions we've had about like co-option of language and how kind of other actors end up playing a role in what is supposed to be something with good intentions. And I'm just kind of curious, uh, you know, like you mentioned APCs, 
as a necessary evil of getting started. Now we do have like $12,000 APC to publish nature. And I'm curious as you're trying these new models or thinking about them, if you have any sort of decision-making about like how could this potentially be co-opted? Obviously you can't be responsible for bad actors or the actions of others, but I'm just kind of curious if that is coming into those conversations. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, you know, um, yes, I think everything we do might be co-opted and I think we really need to, to, to think about that. I think the way we're thinking about it is that we have to be transparent about the objectives. We have to work with diverse communities, listen for blockers, listen to for those risks and try to mitigate them and try to be very transparent and open about that. And I think that if there is transparency in the system built from the from the beginning, and if we work in collaboration with other stakeholders, I think there will be better ways of mitigating these kinds of risks. But um, yes. Yeah. Um, thank you for your talk. I'm trying to figure out exactly which question I want to ask. Um, I guess, you know, so much of the ecosystem relies on volunteer labor, and there are different things that people get out of that. You get prestige, you get your article published. Um, what's your feeling about the reliance on editors, reviewers, people who are, it seems like a lot of this addresses the author need, APC, no APC, but um, on the reviewer side and the editor side, there's just so much work going on behind the scenes to make these operations go. Yes, um, it's certainly, uh, I think we are relying enormously in the scholarly communication ecosystem on, on the willingness and, uh, and, and the behavior of, 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 um, of people who offer that, that volunteer work. Um, we are trying to provide uh, recognition for this work. Again, it's, it's very difficult to, um, to influence that, but making that much more transparent, you know, opening up peer review, offering options for you know, having records of peer review being recognized and so on, pushing uh, this peer review activity to our kids, for example. I mean, these are the kinds of things we're trying to do to do that. It's very difficult to influence um, uh, people who, who is going to take that into, into account, uh, basically. But I also think that there is a, I mean, we're also trying to do things to, to limit the burden, right? I mean, we're trying really to work with other publishers also in having peer review being much more portable, uh, we have worked with pre review. We try to integrate there the, the volunteer work that is happening in different places. We're trying to diversify the pools so that we have people from more regions, but also more early career researchers and so on. There's a lot of resources on our website for education. So we're trying to balance that, but it's a very, it's, I think I, I I don't see an, an end to that because there there is a it's it's a cost to the to the system as well. But having really thinking deliberately about how we can support these people and also um, uh, really make that work much more visible is, is important. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, hi, Scott Edmonds, GigaScience. Um, I'd like to ask a question on behalf of your non-human readers. Uh -huh. um, so when uh, open access, when PLOS and BMC and Berlin Declaration 20 odd years ago were defining open access, they put the clauses in about ma machine readability is going to be important, right? We, we, yeah. we, we want to push this. We didn't really know what, at the time, 20 years later, what that, that was going to entail. And in the recent um, court case between OpenAI and um, I think New York Times, they um, got access to the, um, uh, what are the main sources of training data? And the number one um, peer reviewed, highest quality training data that they have is the PLOS corpus, right? And the GLAM data, uh, GLAM journal data is not there, right? There's the, the, None of that is is included and open OpenAI, ChatGPT works better because of, because of PLOS. Um, but there is pushback about this. We've heard this from other speakers saying, you know, people want to don't want their content to be read in this way. So is, what, is, what are your thoughts and, and PLOS's thoughts on, on this? I mean, it's, it's a very good question. And, and you know, we, the, the, um, I think we're, we're watching the debate as well. I mean, we're very much of the, of the options that, of the opinion that it's a better thing to have models that are trained on quality data. And so I'm actually quite, quite, happy to see that um i think and we have licenses that have, we've we've as you said we've built that in since the beginning you know there is a very interesting thing most of our content is cc by and the by part of that becomes very murky 
in that training model, right? And so I think that it's very much in the spirit of the Creative Commons license and where it becomes problematic is how attribution is being, is, is being recognized. And I don't know what we can do for that at the moment. Um, it's really, you know, on balance, I think it's a better, it's a better thing that, that this corpus is available for that. Um, and I think that the people who have published with PLOS, I mean, we haven't had direct people saying, I want, you know, I want you to take my license, to change my license or something, right? I mean, I think that there is really that, that altruistic view as well in the community of we wanted to publish open access so that everybody can can benefit from that. Um, but I think it's going to be something that continues to be to be an issue. Hi, thank you very much for your presentation. So I have a short question regarding openness. I mean, uh, how open is the Open Plus publisher? Um, maybe in your data, your software, your your line of work, your protocols, etc. What you're proud of, what do you think that could be improved? And a small comment regarding the the map that you show from Juan Pablo Alperin, which uh, which yeah, of course it shows the asymmetry of the production of of, of knowledge, but but that map was uh, oriented to 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 talk about how bad is Scopus in harvesting uh, the yeah. generation of knowledge, uh, like for instance, 93% of the production, that, which is in Diamond journals, is not indexed by Scopus and that kind of stuff. So I applaud the, the, your initiative for research assessment meant to be more integrative of that data. Maybe you can comment a little bit more about those initiatives. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, so I think in the, in, in the point I was trying to make with this map is really that we are, you know, we don't necessarily think about that, right? We're using Scopus or other things. And, and it's really something that 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 asymmetry is, is incredible. And it's certainly not a comment on the fact that this research doesn't exist or it's not quality, right? It's just our systems are really myopic when it when it comes to that. Um, I mean, openness of, of our processes and things, we are trying to be as open as possible in, in, in again, because one of the... Um, MO of PLUS is really, we're not trying to be the best, right? We wanted to do something, and the only one to do something, we want to do something so that we can inspire others to, to do, if it's if we are successful to adopt it as well. Um, so there's a number of things we've done where, you know, we are, um, uh, we're, we're, other publishers reach out and ask, how did you do this, right? I mean, the credit taxonomy is an example. We we were the first one to adopt it. It's no an ISO standard, um, but we've had, you know, Elsevier, and said, how did you do it? We want to do it too. And we didn't say, no, we don't talking to you because you're Elsevier. We actually really engaged with them and they've launched it on, a, on, on hundreds of journals and it's really made a difference for the credit taxonomy. So I think that, that that's the kind of thing. Um, you know, we've done, we do the same thing on editorial policies. We take a lot of time uh, that the editorial team really invests in developing policies and, and, and being um, uh, on top of like the challenges that are that are, and then we are sharing with others, and we've seen um, other other publishers adopting some of the policies we've 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 taken or or asking us about the the implementation and things like that. In terms of the systems we're using, it's kind of a mixed bag because we are also using some infrastructure that is commercial, right? Do we like it? No. Um, but you know, we also have a history of having tried to develop on, which hasn't quite been a great success. So, I mean, clearly for this new project I'm talking about, we everything is going to be open, right? We want it to be open source because we want it to be to be able to be re, um, uh, reused. So every development that we make will be open from that perspective. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Thank you for a great presentation. I was very interested about the new project that you mentioned. I had a couple of questions um, and I recognize it's early days, so TVD is also fine. Um, the, so the two questions are one, will you consider going beyond uh, content in English uh, for the equity aspect? Again, given that you're going to cover different things in the, in the process, if I understood uh, from, from what you were describing. And the other aspect related to the APCs, um, are you considering having conversations with the many groups that are already looking into this? There is a big push in Europe and projects ongoing looking into the ecosystem of diamond journals and how to sustain them and what needs to happen. 
for them to be sustainable. Plus, there's also been a strong legacy from Latin America, for example. I'm sure there are other efforts elsewhere. I'm just less familiar, so I'm mentioning what I know. So there is, I think there are things that we may be able to learn from other groups who have been thinking about this. So I just wonder if you had this in the plan to have those conversations. Thank yeah, you. no, absolutely. Um, uh, so I, I mean, I think to your, your point about the language, this is really something we want to consult on. I mean, there are, we have... We know that from some of our communities and editorial communities, there is really this desire to be able to, to be more um, uh, multilingual. Um, how you do, how we do it, and and what investment it requires is also something we need to to consider. And how, we, but also because the content, all our content is open and CC by, uh, we're hoping that we can work with other groups. And and I think that translation in particular is a place where AI might actually really help and decrease the cost of, of doing that. So again, this is going to be, there is no, um, we're not predetermining a lot of that. So it's really going to be done in consultation and absolutely learning from different types of model. I mean, the, the work we're doing with Coalition S and GISC is also very much plugged into these initiatives in Europe to try to consider um, other models. Um, but yeah, your point about Latin America being very, very advanced there. It's a very different ecosystem, though, and it's a very different thing. But we, I'm, I'm absolutely sure we can learn from, from um, engaging. But... Hi, thanks for your talk. Uh, I'm curious about any insights you have into the review process of data, uh, either from the perspective of reviewers' workload issues, as well as its effectiveness and any trends you may have seen. Yeah, um, I mean that's it's a it's a big objective of of our um, project as well is start starting to look at what does it mean to communicate these different and to actually um, make these different types of output amenable to um, evaluation. Uh, I am absolutely not guaranteeing that we're going to peer review everything we're publishing, right? This would be absolutely increasing the burden on that. But we do want to work with groups who are interested in this, and we're looking at it from different perspectives. So we want to understand from the research communities what are the minim what are minimal things that we could do, um, perhaps automating, perhaps not, um, that could guarantee a certain sort of minimal level of quality control. And then make available to and and work with others so that we can make visible other types of evaluation. Um, I mean, just an example: we are we're in discussions with um, some groups who are interested in rerunning code, for example, right? So if we if we are partnering with a group like that and just getting back on our platform the signal that this code has been rerun and it's fine, this would be an example of something that we can do, plugging into uh, initiatives that already exist. Um, you know, very, very interested in the make data count um, uh, corpus because that's really a demonstration of reuse, which is a proxy for quality. Um, so, so really these kinds of things, looking for these proxies and these signals of usefulness, quality uh, will be very much part of the, pro the project we have. I don't think so. Hi, thanks a lot for, for your talk. Um, so I really appreciated your comment on on you know the importance of reforming research assessment and as a researcher myself you know I I spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to make my work more reproducible and sometimes at the expense of doing other things that could advance my career um, but I'm just thinking so there's a lot of movement in that space right now um, and you talked about giving visibility to these different types of research outputs um, so like how do we make sure that that's done. I guess in a meaningful way. I think you actually just answered the question in, in the previous one, so maybe it's more of a comment, but you know, or are we just moving towards a future where we're looking at the number of publications that have, you know, data sharing, co-chairing, and you know, and we're kind of just like starting a new cycle of, you yeah. know. No, that that's an excellent point, Yuen. It's really a, it's really an important and to the point that was made earlier about you know watching for unintended consequences of some of the things, uh, I think it's very important. I mean, we've started, you know, looking with this open science indicator data set, for example, and all that. We've been very clear that we want to be very responsible about how this is being used. And for example, I think there is a lot of awareness about that um, uh, in these different initiatives. So for example, in terms of the, the indicators of, of open science practices and all that, um, the, uh, UNESCO has this new um, initiative, which, which is really about establishing principles to start, right? And saying, 
this is one it's one element to make these things visible it's not the only the, the only one right and making it and we really need to move to how useful is this and reuse is one aspect but it's probably not sufficient i mean you know we had examples in the fabulous talk from daniela yesterday about how data is being used in different ways well what does that mean in terms of the content that we in the scholarly ecosystem are publishing right is it being reused in in policy making is it you know what what is that what are these kinds of things so really continuing to look at usefulness writ large and contributions to um to to the, the the body of knowledge is really is really important thanks yeah so i think um we'll go